As we continue configuring and upgrading our Atari ST, we're going to come across different software distribution formats. Now, while commercially sold applications usually came with an installer, shareware and public domain software often arrived on magazine cover discs. And on those discs, it was compressed to pack more programs onto a single floppy. Now, we kind of take compression and decompression for granted these days. Compressing a folder to a zip file and decompressing a zip file into a folder are baked into the operating system on modern machines in Mac OS, on Windows, and on most Linux desktops. The existence of tools like 7-Zip, which can handle more or less any compression file format that you throw at it, is what's expected. Back in the day, this wasn't the case at all. There were both competing commercial file formats and open source formats too. And these often came with different tools for compressing and decompressing the archives. Now, often the decompression tools for a particular format were free, but the compression tools had to be paid for. So here I've copied unzip, unra, unarge into my uh, CMD folder, but I don't have the equivalent compressors. Now, that doesn't really matter to me because I'm a net consumer of archives when I'm installing software, not a producer. Now, these tools are command line based and each tool implements its own distinct set of flags and parameters. And it's kind of all confusing because there was no standardization across these tool sets. Confusingly, compression tools were often distributed on cover disks compressed using a different compression system. So in our case here, we have G and zip that's been distributed as an LH archive file. And I mean, sometimes if you're really lucky, the tools got shipped as a self-extracting TOS program. Now we could add the compression tools to our CLI path. In fact, implicitly we have done because they're in the command folder and use them from the command line like we are here. Or we could come up with a more pleasant and user-friendly solution. And I don't know about you, but I definitely prefer pleasant and user-friendly to whatever the alternative is. There were a number of shells for individual compression tools. So here I'm unpacking a shell for stzip, which unsurprisingly was a shell for the zip command. Now, luckily, this came as a self-extracting archive. I'm going to copy it into a local folder, run the self-extracting archive, which is a TOS file, and it will extract its content. Now, once it's extracted, we can run the app. And I'm just copying a zip file over to play with. And at the risk of being a little meta, this zip file contains a load of other shells for other formats and associated archive tools. Now, the UI of the stzip tool is very simple. There's a list of files and folders in the archive shown on the left, and the sts file system on the right. So to extract our archive, we select the target folder on the right, which is going to be our temp folder on the C file, and click the central extract button, and they'll zip out. You can add files to a zip file in reverse. So you select them in the file explorer on the right and click the compress button. So extraction is relatively slow. So I think I'm going to speed this up if necessary. Finally, once everything's extracted and we can see it, and it's there and it works, we're going to delete it. And we're going to delete it using a feature I don't think I've shown before in uh, NeoDesk in that when you're dragging files, there's a little trash can icon that appears in the footer bar, and you can drag your files to that, and it'll delete them for you. Saves all that moving across to that trash can that's far, far away over there on the left. So shells were all well and good, but the idea of having seven shells for seven archive formats is just a little bit fiddly, because again, no consistency between them. Well, it works slightly differently. I prefer a unified shell. Now, there were several multi-format archive shells around in the day. If you looked at the archive we just extracted and the files that came from it, it had a program in there called ArcShell. And ArcShell was very, very popular at the time. However, my favorite was always PackShell. And that's a tool that operates using a desktop metaphor. It's really intuitive and it's very easy to use. To install PackShell, we're just going to drag and drop it into our gem apps folder. Now we're going to need to configure Geneva to run it as a single tasking app. If we don't run it as a single testing app, PackShell and NeoDesk end up fighting and then everybody's a loser in that situation. So using the Geneva Task Manager, we're going to create or set what's called a permanent flag or the PackShell program. Click new, create a new permanent flag. We set the app name to packshell.prg. We uncheck the multitask flag to make it a single tasking app. And then we save that. Now when we run the app, you'll see we get a prompt dialogue and we can say sleep all, which will then run the pack shell command in single tasking mode and all of the running applications will be put to sleep in the background. And we're in. Now, at this point, you might notice that the drive letters aren't correctly positioned. They should look like this. They don't. And I did some experimentation using Xboot to change configs and I tried booting to Emutos with PackShell, Emutos with NeoDesk and PackShell, and they all work fine. But when I ran Geneva 
without NeoDesk, but with PackShell as the main app, it showed the same problems. So it's Geneva interacting with PackShell, or more likely the reverse, that's the issue. And while it's nice to know what the issue is, I'm just going to live with this because I, I want to use this too. So what I'm going to do is rearrange my drive icons so I know which drive is which visually. Oh, and uh, on the subject of me calling Emutos, uh, Emutos, I've had it pointed out that, and it's undoubtedly true, that it should be pronounced Emutos, as it's us for emulators. But I'm afraid it's baked into my brain now, so um, all I can say is please forgive me and resist the urge to throw shoes at the TV when I say it wrong. There's nothing much I can do about it now. Backshell comes with support for the following compression formats. That's LHARC, ZIP, ZOO, ARC, ARG, TAR, Diffy and raw. What Diffy is, I have no idea. That one must have just passed me by back in the day. The presence of raw really surprised me. Because I still think of raw as a relatively new compression format. So I hit Wikipedia to look it up and found out that it was first published in 1993. 1993. It's 30 years old. It's old enough to vote and be settled down and have a family. And I think it's new. Never mind. Time goes by. The shell can read the directory structures of all the supported file formats. However, to be able to decompress or compress data, you need to point it to the actual apps to do this. So here I'm going to set up unzip to decompress zip files. We don't have the full zip app, so we won't be able to create zip files, just decompress them. And while I, when I set this, I also remove the minus R flag as it's not needed in this version of unzip because it's implicit. And if you specify it, it won't work. So back in the shell, let's save the settings. Pack shell is used just like the desktop. I'm going to navigate to a zip file on the D drive and also to a temporary folder on the C drive. When we double click to enter the zip file, we see a list of files in it. I'm going to enable directory mode. And this means then instead of just getting a list, we're going to get a directory structure. So it's going to be just like navigating a real file system. If you drag the root folder, and if you can't hear it in my voice, I was kind of using shock quotes there. This is not really a folder. It's actually the zip file itself into the target folder that will extract the entire archive. And while I've sped that up a bit, the whole process took about 18 seconds. So you know, not too bad. So can we take part of an archive? Obviously, the answer is yes. And it's as simple as navigating through the zip file to the sudo folder or the file you want to get onto your machine and then dragging it across to the target folder. Backshell extracts the file to the target and reproduces all the folders up to it. OK, so we can consume archives using this tool. How easy is it to create them? And the answer is easy. What I'm going to do is set up Packshell to use the Zoo archiving tool. And I'm going to create the archive using that. Because Zoo is one of the ones I have that have both the archiving and unarchiving ability. We select File New from the Packshell menu. We navigate to the temp folder and we specify our name as Packshell.Zoo. And what we're going to do is we're going to archive the Packshell application into a Zoo archive. Now, packing is slower than unpacking. And in this case, it took about 1 minute 26 for not very much data to be pressed. And I mean, it's hardly surprising because it's computationally intensive and we're using a 68,000 with just an 8 megahertz clock on it. I mean, if you look at the data as it goes by, you can notice that the height file is compressed at 0%. And that's because it's already compressed. Its contents are LHA encoded. And that's kind of a timely reminder for me to tell you that the next video in this series is going to be about height files. I'm looking forward to making that one. We're in a good place. We can compress decompress and view archive data in a number of formats. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that the implementation of the compression algorithms used in these apps is old, so it's not necessarily going to be capable of handling data compressed using the modern equivalent of these tools, well, at least in all cases. But if you're picking up archives that were compressed back in the day from like your Tosec collection or whatever, they will be supported. And as an aside, if you're working on an emulator like a Hatari, as I am in this case, the best way to do this is probably not to use a shell like this at all. It's to decompress the files on your host machine and then use a Gemdos partition to get them onto your ST drive. That's just the way to go. But on a real ST, these tools are vital. So I hope you enjoyed this little romp through the fields of compression. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.